into the facility for rare acids with beans, or adapter. This Saturday morning physics talk is part of an initiative that Ethel called the Advanced Study Gateway. And the purpose of the Advanced Study Gateway is to inspire people by bringing together researchers, innovators, creative thinkers, artists, performers from all different fields, and building ties between Michigan State University and the community. Today, we are very pleased to have Dr. Stephanie Lanz here to talk about a microscopic view of stars. Dr. Lanz is currently a P. Gregor's Hansen postdoctoral fellow at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory, or NSCL. She received her PhD in physics from the University of Notre Dame in 2016, where she was a Department of Energy National Human Security Aid Administration Stockpile Stewardship Graduate Fellow. She completed her bachelor's degree in physics at Brandon Macon Women's College in 2009. And while working on her doctorate, she established a national chapter of the Association for Women in Science. Her research is in nuclear astrophysics, which focuses on answering questions about how the elements of in the universe were created. As part of her graduate work, she helped to build and commission one of Notre Dame's new accelerators, which then she used to perform measurements of nuclear reactions. Her research at NSDL includes investigating various properties of radioactive nuclei that are created in stellar collisions and explosions. Before beginning the program, though, I need to take care of a few administrative items. In the very unlikely event of alarm or of the emergency, we should exit the building through the doors as we should can. If you'd like more information about the Advanced Study Gateway or the, the Saturday morning business <coughs> talks that are to come, um, go to afgrip.msu.edu slash gateway. And the last administrative item is to remind you to silence your phones if you have the best order. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephanie Lyons. Microscopic way. Um, so, there we go. That's better. Go ahead and get started. Ah, that was The first question, as Dean mentioned in sort of the intro, I like to look at where and how the elements were made. But a good lead in into that is understanding. What elements make up the world that we live in? So here is a pie chart of the composition, elemental composition of Earth, broken down. So you can see, obviously, because of the ocean and the air, we have a lot of oxygen. Uh, silicone here, 27%, a lot of sand. We have iron, calcium, a little bit of titanium, and then this slice that's a bunch of other things. All the other elements don't really fall under um, a percentage that we can get them, but they're there. Also, we can look at just ourselves and what's the elemental composition of the human body, right? So um, looking again, we have a lot of oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, of course, carbon, things like that, mainly because we're a lot of water, protein. But one of the Something that might even be more interesting to you is that your cell phone is made up of roughly 46 different elements. All the way from some of the lighter elements, like lithium, to help have a battery, all the way up to some of our heaviest ones, such as lead, platinum, gold, all components in your phone. So, where do all of these elements come from? Participation. <laughs> you sort of. <laughs> ah, someone was paying attention in the beginning. So, as Carl Sagan said, we're all made of star stuff. That should make you feel pretty stellar. <laughs> right? So, Hollywood's got it right. We're all stars here. Um, and I like this picture of the NGC uh, open star cluster. This was taken by the Subaru uh, telescope, the multiple different wavelength observation. Uh, Piled on top of each other so that you can see both the gas and the stars. So this is open clusters are kind of a cool sort of what we call stellar nursery. 
in the light blue, those are young stars. They're just forming bright. The red are a little bit older, but they're still young stars. And then, of course, you see the gas, the gas that stars are sort of composed of. And observations of these systems and various stars tell us a lot about the different elements that are in there. So what occurs is light from inside the star travels outward, and as it interacts with the different elements that are in the stellar environment, it produces particular wavelengths of light. We observe those either through Earth-based or space-based telescopes, and then Astronomers get sort of a session. This is an idealized version of uh, various wavelengths in the visible light. And the little the black lines would be uh, wavelengths that are absorbed. So those ones were missing. That's what indicated that those exist, that those atoms in the star absorb those. So observations can tell us a lot about the composition of stars and insight into the amount of a given element in the star's atmosphere. Here I also want to show. This is um, the ASCA X-ray telescope. This is the Advanced Satellite for Cosmology and Astrophysics. It was in orbit from about 1994 to 2003, taking pictures. And this is one of the spectra that it was taken of Cassiopeia A. And so from this, you see intensity here on the y-axis versus energy. Um, and those peaks then are indicative of the different elemental lines that were visible in the stars. So we know that Cassiopeia A has some neon, and iron, there's another iron peak here, calcium, argon, silicon sulfur, but how, how are all of these elements getting into that system? Well, as we looked at before, it was gas. This interstellar gas creates these new stars, blue ones. Eventually, those stars go through their full lifetime, and then they, they die in a catastrophic blast called a supernova. And while you look at the supernova picture, the supernova is actually over here somewhere. <laughs> it's the small piece of the galaxy there. And from that blast, a ton of the ejecta from that supernova, so everything that's inside that star gets blown out back into the interstellar media, mixed in, new stars are created, and those elements can get put back into new stars and synthesized in a new way. So that's great. We understand the general concept, but how more specifically are the elements formed? A great general knowledge is good, but if we want to say how is gold formed, we need a more specific question. So we want to look at a star in a microscopic fashion. But is, this picture seems sort of improbable, right? It's a cartoon for a reason. You can't really delve in and put a microscope up to a star. And there's a couple problems, right? So this is a picture of our own sun. So let's look at it. What are some of the big issues, the glaring issues, with trying to put sort of this microscopic view of a star? Well, for one, look, 92 billion miles away which is roughly 12,000 times around Earth. Trying to put these scales into something more, more perspective, right? So that's a lot of times around the Earth. I mean, it would be very expensive around the world trips by airplane to achieve that. Additionally, it's very warm, as we know. The sun is almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface alone, and it's 30 or 28 billion degrees Fahrenheit at the center. To me, those numbers don't mean a whole lot because they're very large. But I do think everyone's had either cookies or pie, and so the surface temperature is about 28 times hotter than the temperature you need to bake some cookies or a pie at in your oven. About 80,000 times hotter at the center than your typical oven. That's around 350. So, no pot holders are going to help you with this. But can we look at this question in a different way? We've been looking at the stellar systems and how they create elements from a very astronomy-focused, astrophysical perspective. Observations, 
uh, and things like that. How we can observe what they're doing, but then we don't really get an inner workings, right? So what if we change our perspective? This will be sort of the theme. Scientists have to do this all the time. To solve a problem, you sort of have to switch up your viewpoint. What if instead we look at the system through the lens of all the different elements that we already know, the end product? You know, the stars are synthesized, in, in, uh, elements are synthesized in stars. So if we start with the end product and work our way backwards, maybe we can understand some of these mechanisms that occur to give us this. So it's exactly what we're going to do. But as a nuclear physicist, we don't typically use a periodic table very often. This is very uh, excellent organization of the elements. If you're a chemist and you want to look at them um, for their different chemical properties. But in terms of nuclei, there's a lot of other features that are missing from this diagram. So what we're going to do, we want to put them into a different chart to solve the chart of nuclides. So each individual isotope uh, is a nuclei on this chart. So just to orient you, this y-axis, we'll use this chart a lot throughout the rest of the talk, so I want to make sure it's very clear. Proton number, so this is your z. These are all the different elements. Instead of having them organized in sort of a grid, we've stacked them on top of each other. Each line is a different element. Okay, oxygen, nickel, tin, lead, right? They're all up there. And then on the x-axis, we define them by number of neutrons. So if we focus on just helium, because there's only a few, and so it fits on the screen, um, we can look at, you can see helium, they're all helium, they all have two protons, right? Elements are defined by the proton number. And then the number of neutrons helps us define the isotope of that element. That gives us a specific um, isotope that we're looking at, right? You can say helium-6, and then you'd know helium is 2, and I must have 4 neutrons. Color coding on these diagrams is such that you go sort of by how they're likely to decay if they don't live for very long. So the black ones are stable, and you'll notice they kind of run along the midpoint. We call it the valley of stability. On this, towards the neutron arrow, right, going in positive number of neutrons here, they typically decay by a certain type of uh, decay, and so they're all kind of colored in the same way. The same on the proton are set. There's many more protons, they decay very similarly. And as you get into these really heavy guys up here, you get a new sort of scattering. You'll notice, too, that so the black ones are stable, but as we go out from stability, um, I don't have the half-lives listed. That's sort of the time that they generally live for. So the half-life will tend to be smaller and smaller as you move out less and less likely for it to continue, for it to, to stick around for a while. Like us, we like to be you know, Netflix and chill, we like to be in a very relaxed state. Nuclei also are like that. They want to go down to their least energetic state. And so uh, stable nuclei at their lowest energy level, that's what they like to do. Expel all their energy and chill. Some other things that you can learn just from looking at this chart, which is very, I think is very interesting. It's cool that you can just like organize things in this way and some things become very apparent. For example, why doesn't the value of stability, the black squares, follow the n equals z line? If we were to draw a line of proton number equals neutron number, it clearly shifts off of that line. Why is that? Why do you think? Yeah. Do the neutrons, do the neutrons help with uh, gluing the nucleus together? Yeah, sort of. That's a very, yeah, it's a, it's a, you're leading right into the right answer. So, um, protons are positively charged particles. Neutrons are, are neutral, num neutral particles. So as you increase proton number, you can imagine a positive and a positive side of a magnet. They don't like to come together, right? They want to repel each other. So in a similar way, the two protons, positively charged, are going to, as you put more of them together, they're going to say, no, that's OK, I don't want to, right? They're going to start spreading. They don't want to stick together. Having those neutral particles, those neutrons in, help bind 
those larger numbers of protons together by providing the space necessary to hold it together. We're also going to talk a little bit more about the glue that holds nuclei together here in a minute. So yeah, this force, this sort of repulsion, is called the Coulomb force. That's the force of from charge. That's what we're battling. Additionally, we want to look at some other properties of nuclei. So you can imagine for each isotope here, we'd like to know mass, how long they live for, how they decay, right? We have sort of a general idea, but understanding the exact mechanisms of various decay pathways is very important for understanding how they interact. How do they interact with each other? If I put two of them together, what happens? What's the likelihood that something happens? How are the protons and neutrons organized in the nucleus, right? So you have an atom that's got all the electrons and, and stuff, and then the nucleus is on the inside. It'd be like if you put a basketball in the center and start a stadium, electrons would be in the crowd, and the basketball would be your nucleus. So in terms of size, that's sort of what you're talking about. We're very focused on the pinpoint. So one of those things that we can look at, and it will help us understand things uh, astrophysically, also, how do you determine the mass of the nucleus? Right? That was one of the basic properties that we saw. So let's take helium-4, for example. So we know, because the slide that we just had, that this will be two protons and two neutrons. Right? So how would you propose going about measuring the mass of that? There's no wrong answers. It's not like a quiz. A fun Saturday morning physics talk, right? <laughs> no. The, the weight of two protons added to the weight of two neutrons. Ooh, that is a class. Gold stars for you. So, could you weigh them on a scale? Probably not. <laughs> right? As we just talked about, they're pretty small. In fact, the size of the nucleus, we don't typically work in feet in the scientific realm, but this is a public fact. I don't know about you, but when I build stuff at home, I measure things in feet still, even though I'm a scientist. So the size of the nucleus is 6.5 times 10 to the minus 15 feet. I really don't know if you're going to find a feet measure to do that. That is 350 trillion times smaller than a soccer ball, or 50 trillion. No, billion, 50 billion. There's too many zeros. Smaller than the diameter of your hair. So we're talking pretty small, probably not going to fit on a scale, but we could maybe do some math if we know the, the uh, mass of the neutron and the proton, which we do. We would question like, why don't you know the mass of the neutron, but we'll get there. So we have helium 4, we're going to have two protons. Plus two neutrons. Pretty easy. Pretty easy math. I'll just go through it. So two times, and we'll just go with hydrogen to put those electrons back in. They cause problems if you don't. Plus two times the mass of a neutron. Should equal then the total mass here. So if we do that in these uh, atomic mass units, we do know these out to a tremendously uh, far number of digits. And the precision is necessary in this case. So if we do this math, you can see that mass of uh, hydrogen, the proton plus an electron, is a little bit less than the mass of the neutron. But if we do that math, we get 4.03 blah, 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 AME. Cool. But like I said, if you know the mass of proton and neutron, it's likely that someone measures the mass of uh, helium-4, and they have. And that's the actual math. So what happened? Well, well what's the same? Did we do something wrong? Is our theory wrong? I mean, that happens all the time. And that propels science forward. We could learn something if the theory was wrong, but it seems like a pretty basic concept. Let's work with that. Let's work with it a little bit. If we have a calculated mass value and an actual mass value, what's the, quantitatively, what's the difference? Let's subtract them. Okay, so we can call this then the mass excess. 
from what we calculate. So it's 0 0.03, 0 0.03 AMU, sort of this mass excess. And if we're trying to understand what's going on in the system, based on what we calculate and what is really there, we could say, what does that mass equal in a different quantity? You can go ahead and utilize one of the most famous equations in physics, right? Maybe quantify that as energy equals mc squared. So if we do that and we say, we're going to take this mass excess and we're going to compute using this equation, it's done the math for us, so we don't have to go through all of the conversions, to this 28.3 MeV, that's mega electron volts. That is the quantity in electron volts, is the amount of voltage of an electron. It's a really small quantity. In fact, it takes about a trillion uh, EVs to power a light bulb, 100 watt light bulb for an hour. So you can see that we're dealing with sort of a different energy scale here. The units aren't particularly important for this, just to know that then if we divide that amount of energy that we have as excess from our calculation to the actual mass, we divide that by the number of particles in our helium-4, four, so 4, we get 7.07 MeV per U in energy. So the U is the number of particles. So say we were to do this for all of the nuclei. We did. So you can see here, we have helium 4, 7.07 .07 here. And we've done all the other ones too. So this is called that max, max excess in energy, we call the binding energy. So it's not weighable, weighable in the mass of helium 4, right? The mass is less than what we calculated. So this energy is holding. We can understand it as holding that nucleus together. So this is called a binding energy, binding those particles together. And that's held together via a, a nuclear force that's called a strong force, very strong, as the name will suggest, um, holding the nuclei together. So we have this average binding energy per nucleon, so that's 7.07 .07 that we calculated for helium, versus the number of nucleons in the nucleus, or A. You can see. All the way up, we get this point here up by iron 56 is sort of like the top point. Well, that's interesting. It has a maximum, this trend. You can see that the trend of the line is positive on this side of iron, and the trend past iron is negative. That can tell us something. Maybe that can tell us some inferences about how nuclei and stars are, are formed. In fact, that positive slope on the binding energy would indicate that nuclei can then be fused together. And so up to iron on our chart, then, we uh, understand by this fusion mechanism that stellar burning, that's the category that we call it, is used in stellar systems to synthesize elements all the way up to iron. How did they do that? Well, so here's a cartoon of a star. You have that interstellar medium gas kind of mixing together, and when enough is formed, gravity begins to take over and it pushes things together. And so it should just like continue to crash down forever. But eventually, that gravity is causing enough force that helium, those smallest particles, hydrogen, is going to start fusing to become helium in the center. That process of fusing hydrogen into helium and creating these helium isotopes creates a lot of energy. And so you get this thermal pressure outward that balances that gravity crushing in. And so then your star is in this stellar equilibrium. Like our sun, it's pretty constant. Things are being fused in there, generating a lot of energy. We enjoy that on Earth. And then the outer part is mostly hydrogen that exists. So you can say, okay, 
Well, then once all the hydrogen is burned into helium, what happens? Right? We've got to get all the way up to iron. So this similar type of process occurs all the way up to iron. So after the hydrogen is pretty much all used up and fused into helium, gravity will again start to win, right? So your thermal pressure out is decreasing because you're not generating enough energy. And that uh, gravity is starting to push in. But we've just converted a bunch of hydrogen into helium. So now we have helium in our core. So it's going to push in gravity until it, by pressure, it has enough energy to start using helium into carbon. So that would be the next phase. We're going to start putting helium atoms together to create carbon. That also generates energy. So at a certain point, then, the thermal pressure is, again, going to stop the star from gravitationally <laughs> pulling inward, and we're going to get a stable environment again. So this continues all the way through until you get an iron core. Now, the number of phases for stellar burning processes are dependent upon the mass of the star that you start with. You can imagine if you have a very light system, you're not going to build all the way up to iron because there's just not going to be enough material. So you can see in like a very idealized system, um, you would get sort of this onion structure. It's like all these layers. You're like the best job stopper ever, um, where you have an iron ash core here, and then you can imagine the star like this, then go to supernova and all of this material gets blasted out, then your next stars have maybe um, neon and magnesium and other things in them mixed in that hydrogen can be fused into helium using some of these as catalysts, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, some cool pictures of uh, stars. This is Arcturus, the North Star. Um, it is a it's larger than the Sun, but it's a stellar burning phase star. It's not a, a we'll get to some of the other stellar systems that are creating other elements. Um, and then this is a picture of the Seven Sisters, which is a common, commonly observed. You can observe it from Earth with a, a nice telescope. Um, the Pleiades system. You can see there's seven stars, they're called the seven sisters. And they're all pretty much in this um, in a stellar burning phase. So they pretty much based off of the spectra that they're not uh, they're not too massive. So we're understanding then from math that we have to have some sort of stellar burning process, right? We're fusing elements to create other ones. So then let's just keep asking that question. How? How are we doing that, how is that system operating? So here is one of these um, systems. This is not the most uh, abundant process in our own sun. Our own sun fuses hydrogen into helium in a very sort of sequential fashion from hydrogen to helium. In uh, more massive stars that have previous generations of stellar uh, ejecta in them, you can actually fuse hydrogen into helium using carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as the catalyst point for that. So you're not going to use up your carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, but you're merely going to use them as sites by which you're going to accumulate these, um, synthesize these nuclei. So that's what this picture is. This is the so-called TNO cycle. And if you look at how our own sun synthesizes hydrogen into helium, predominantly it is through a different mechanism than this, but a small component, I believe it's like 25% or so, is this cycle because it does already have some carbon, nitrogen, oxygen enrichment in it. So, starting from the top, your carbon is going to capture, that's what we call it, basically it's a reaction happening, right? Capture a, a proton or a hydrogen. It's going to, there's going to be a reaction. It's going to emit a packet of energy. That's what this symbol is. And we're resultant into nitrogen 13. As we continue to go around, you have some of these are radioactive and then therefore they decay. And then you continue all the way around until finally nitrogen 15 captures one of these protons. There's a reaction. And then it's most favorable for it to emit that helium and you're back to carbon 12. So that's what I mean by catalysts. 
carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are merely sites by which we're fusing these on. So let's look at this first thing. So you can understand now just by how kind of far we've dug into uh, a reaction itself, how far we have to kind of look, how focused this is. It's not as similar as saying, okay, I want to look at this system and we're going to look at the whole thing as a whole. If I want to know very intensely, you know, the mechanisms, I have to look at each one of these separately. And that's what makes, I think, sort of the nuclear astrophysics realm more difficult in that sense, right? A bunch of these things happening, and to understand a total system, I would have to understand one, two, three, four, five, right? Seven, and this is a very basic system. When you get more reactions happening, this is like a network of things. Things get much more complicated very quickly. So if we want to look at just the carbon-12 plus proton equals nitrogen-13 plus, here I have my little quantum packet of energy that's emitted in this reaction. We have in reaction speak, we're going to get into it a little bit, right? I said these guys. You're going. This is our, our bread and butter in terms of uh, nomenclature for things would be we have a target, a projectile, and product from our reaction. And so, uh, typically, you want something, your heavier thing, to be your target, that will be stationary, your projectile to be the lighter, but you can do it the other way around, make things more fun, by fun, and it's more complicated, <laughs> and then your products. You're going to want to be able to somehow look at what came out of this. You don't just, like, make this happen and then say, oh. because it, you want to be able to quantify what happened so that you understand the probability that this reaction occurs. So let's do that. Let's design an experiment, just conceptually. So to do this, you want to look at this reaction happening at stellar temperatures. We know that those temperatures can be converted into energy, and we can access those energies here on Earth terrestrially using accelerators, superconductors, right? conducting cyclotrons, ephraim eventually. Um, so, if we do that, we have an accelerator, and like I said, we'll just pick the light particle to be our projectile, so that would be protons in this case, and we'll have our target, here's that carbon-12, then we have some detectors to observe one or different types of detectors all in one to observe many different types of products. So then our proton will accelerate, it will hit the carbon, emit these quantum, these uh, packets of energy, which our detectors will then see. Our detectors are not perfect, as you can see by the diagram. They will miss some of what is there. And so to understand the probability of that reaction occurring, you would need to know the number of incoming particles. So if we go backwards here, you need to know the number of protons hitting, how many carbon atoms you have, what you see as the output, and how efficient your detectors are looking at that. And from that, you can extract what's the probability that this reaction occurred. So this is a great conceptual design, and this is definitely how I see our experiments going. Um, in real life, they're a little bit more messy. They sort of look like this. So this is a picture of an accelerator, a tandem accelerator at the INFN. This is a the International Nuclear Laboratory in Italy. Um, they're not the only people that have a tandem. I just want to actually just like the color of this one. But um, we have tandem accelerators, as Dean mentioned. Uh, I did my PhD work at Notre Dame. There are three different accelerators there. One of them is a tandem accelerator, just like this one. Uh, Florida State has a tandem accelerator. There's one at uh, University of Washington. So lots of different universities and places have these. They're very excellent for accelerating stable particles. Protons being a really a nice one because they're easier to generate. Then we use different uh, electric and magnetic elements to direct that beam. As you can imagine, nuclei are not well behaved. They are unruly little guys. And so as they go in their forward direction, accelerated, they also start to divert from their pathway. So they start to spread out, but we like to keep them kind of contained. So we have to use uh, a lot of different instrumentation to do that. And we send them down the beam line, and then there's some walls or something. And then this is a schematic of uh, a detector setup. This is actually 
um, set up with the gadget detector here at NSCL by Chris Reed's research group. Um, so the beam would come in, interact with a target, our target maybe, the center of this uh, target chamber, and then around this, all those um, nice teal things are detectors. This is actually the uh, Vega array, also here at NSCL. So, right, there's a lot of different components, things get complex fast just to understand the probability of one reaction occurring. While well, we wouldn't perform this reaction here at the NSCL because both particles uh, involved are stable, this would be excellent for something at the Notre Dame where they have a stable accelerator, something like that. So let's say we want to look at a different thing, right? Scientists always like to put their PhD work up, and so this is mine. Um, <laughs> so if we want to understand the probability of a specific piece of a process that will occur, we look at the process as a whole, and then we whittle down the thing. So I'm going to take you through. This is like sort of a complex graph, um, but as I mentioned, there are many different processes. Right? We just looked at the CNO cycle um, for hydrogen to fuse into helium, and this is another one. This is called the sodium, uh, the neon sodium cycle. I don't know why we use magnesium out of the equation when we name it, but it's like it doesn't make sense even though they're there. Uh, so the arrows indicate the different reaction pathways, capturing a proton being one of them. That's this like vertical line. We capture a proton, we're increasing the number of Z until you move up on the chart of the side in Z number. Uh, so now we have a different element. And so you can do that. You can also beta decay. That's a specific type of decay where a proton becomes a neutron. So you keep the 21 will stay the same. Because now our proton has become a neutron. And so if you go through this whole cycle, no matter what happens in this interim part, you start with neon 22 gamma, that's what this is, that's the gamma, and you end at sodium 23, which then captures another hydrogen and emits a helium. So that's your alpha, that's what that alpha means, is helium for us. And you return to neon 20. So when you have a bunch of nuclei involved in a bunch of reactions like this, this is what's called a reaction network. Right? You can understand that from networking. This is how they interact, that we understand the pathways that it could go. And so what you do is uh, astrophysical theorists use different properties that we understand of nuclei, and they can theoretically come up with the rate or the probability that each of these reactions will occur. And they can compile the best estimates within the uncertainty, things that they don't know. So that would be an error bar. Um, and they publish them in what we call a rate library. And so then other people can use them to say, okay, which ones are predicted to be the most important out of X you know, reactions that are occurring? And that gives experimentalists such as myself sort of a target. You should look at this one first. This is the most important reaction. So they did that for the neon sodium cycle. In fact, they've done it a couple times. Um, and for both of them, this beginning reaction, neon 20 plus a proton equals sodium 21, was predicted to be the slowest, the most, the least probable of all of these reactions, which means the whole start of this cycle, and the entire pace of the cycle occurring, is dependent upon the probability that that reaction will occur. And so, for my dissertation work, that's what we measure measure this reaction to understand the probability that it would occur. And so what you're seeing in the graph here is this rate comparison. We've taken uh, a rate, this is a standard rate library called NACRA um, that we use. There's also a publication that had some uh, rates for all of these reactions. Um, these are the two that have this first reaction predicted as the least probable. And then in blue is the probability that uh, we measured, we deduced from our measurement of this reaction. And so we've, what I did in this uh, figure here is I took the rates because they're in kind of a different scale, and I've divided them all by the rate in the most popularly used library, this, this black line. So that's why the black line is one, straight across. And the uncertainties in that rate are in the gray banding. So you can see, it's pretty uncertain, like 40% 40, 40 
uncertainty both directions. It's sort of unknown. It could be way at the top, it could be way at the bottom. But that would then dictate how the rest of this whole reaction pathway looks. The other calculations, this Iliadis et al. is a different rate calculation. We divided that by the NACRA as well. And that's uh, the uncertainties are in the orange banding. So you can see as we get uh, higher in temperature here, it sort of does this funny thing where it goes down. That's fine. That means that the calculation was much lower at higher temperatures than predicted. The energy range, the temperature range that this reaction occurs in, is right in this sort of like mid range here. So this is the region of interest for us, is around 0.5. Um, and then you can see the rate that we calculated based on our measurement is actually lower, the median value is actually lower than all of the previous calculations. And our error bars are um, smaller, so these come from how many things we saw come out. Right? Your statistics alone give you uncertainty in your measurement, as well as understanding all of your equipment very well. So if you put that all, all this information that we got from this one measurement back into our understanding of this cycle, you can then understand that yes, this first reaction sets the pace for the whole cycle, and it was less likely to occur than previously thought, which means this whole cycle is slower than previously thought. I don't know who will care about that in the future, but someone will. You're welcome, Laurel. So, and they got me here, so it was great. So, remember our wonderful average binding energy per nucleon as a function of uh, nucleon number, or A? We had this graph and we just talked about this fusion process, how we get uh, up to iron, right? Stellar burning processes. But if you look at the chart of nuclei, there's a whole lot after that, right? So we can't explain by stellar burning all of these guys, which I don't know about you, but gold is up here, so that was important to me. Um, so we have to look for a different process, right? A different process is gonna give us that negative slope. Um, and because we can't fuse things together anymore, we're going to have to figure out a different way to do that. This is done. And this is our called neutron capture processes. And in that way, what's happening is you're capturing a neutron, right? So you're moving that way on the chart. You're getting more radioactive, more unstable, so then you're going to decay back. When you decay back, you're going to increase. You can slowly build them. Okay, we've made observations of, the, uh, of these elements. We understand that there are two different processes that occur for this. What do these processes look like? So the squares represent one of those nuclei on the chart. So they, I should have colored one black, but then you wouldn't have been able to see them. Let's see these over. So one nucleus, we capture a neutron, right? We're gonna move one neutron over, and then you're gonna keep doing that until it's more probable that you will decay back towards Philly. This is beta decay, so that's converting a proton, uh, neutron into a proton in this case. So then our mass will stay the same, our number of nuclei, nuclei will stay the same, but our proton number will increase, and our neutron number will decrease. At that point, it may be likely that it just wants to get rid of it. So it might move over one more, or it might capture a neutron. And so in this way, depending on the environment that you're in, you can, uh, this proceeds either very close to stability, if the neutron number is very low in the environment, then you have time to beta decay back before a neutron will get captured, such as in asymptotic giant branch stars. In this environment, there's not many neutrons around, and so the likelihood that a neutron gets captured is on par with the rate that things beta decay. And so you move very close to stability and you just move up, you go back, you move up this chart really close to stability. So things just kind of capture and decay right close to stability. 
in more explosive systems, which are really interesting, dynamic systems, such as a neutron star merger. We actually saw one for the first time two years ago. It was observed the gravitational waves from the neutron star merger were observed. And then everyone pointed their telescopes where <laughs> the gravitational waves observations were like, it's over there. They've all pointed it. And so we have a ton of data also on the observation, like the different wavelengths of light that came from this event. And from that, we understand that actually some very heavy elements, such as uh, gold and lead, were likely produced in this event, which means that the process is that we are theorizing a current in these environments did happen, which is very exciting, right? So in these environments, as you can imagine, two neutron stars coming together, they swirl around in a binary system, and gravity is slowly pulling their circles closer and closer together until they fly. And it's a cataclysmic event. We have gravity waves going everywhere. And there's particles everywhere. And there's probably a lot of neutrons. Neutron flux very high. So you're going to capture these neutrons very quickly. You're going to speed out away from stability before you have a chance to beta decay. Until you get to a stopping point, and then you'll beta decay, and then you'll keep capturing neutrons, right? So it's very fast process. And I have a little movie of this process. So this is an astrophysical uh, model done by uh, Jonas Lipner and our own uh, Luke Roberts here at the laboratory. Uh, this is a network calculation they call Skynet, for any Terminator fans. Uh, you start with some seed nucleus. This is a chart of nucleus. So what this simulation is going to show you is the predicted rapid neutron captures, this process that we think occurred in the neutron star mergers. So you have to start with something in these simulations, and you set certain temperatures and densities in your system, and what we're going to do is we're going to watch these color-coded seed nuclei. The color coding is according to this abundance here. So more red equals higher abundance. Blue is it's there, but it's not super abundant. I love these movies because it gives you, I think, a very nice visual of exactly this complex process that we're describing. And the nuclear physics involved in making one of these includes masses, half-lives, all the rates for all these reactions, all the rates for all the beta decays, right? So this is like a wealth of nuclear physics information, and we have a long to-do list here at the laboratory based on just this calculation. So if we watch, time is increasing in milliseconds. This is like fast, captured out all the way, and then it'll flash because everything will start to beta decay. And that's at the point when you've sort of exhausted all of your neutrons in the system. And because beta decays happen at a specific rate, um, they're not life. As we get closer and closer to stability, things start to slow down, right? We're at some minutes range. And things are still decaying back to those uh, squares. The boxes are all the stable nuclei. So, uh, we can watch this. So, we have these nuclei are capturing, building up, things are decaying. And then it goes back towards the building. That's my hair. Uh, and so, we want to understand this process using nuclear physics. Each one of those boxes is a different isotope. We can only do one reaction at a time. So that's a lot to have to look at. In fact, it's too many to realistically measure everything. And in fact, a lot of these nuclei we can't access in the laboratory. Currently, we can kind of get <clears throat> mid range, I would say. But not well enough to actually do a reaction. To study a reaction, you need thousands of particles coming down the pipe per second, right? Is the probability of these reactions occurring so low that if you don't want to sit there and count for the lifetime of a grad student, six years, you're going to need to either produce a lot of them at once or you have to find a different way. So let's look at this. Okay, so we know from this graph, from this sort of cartoon of the reactions that were occurring in that we need neutron captures, we need beta decays, probably masses, half-life, all these things. So let's look at the neutron captures. 
this is some of the work that I've been doing here at the laboratory uh, during my postdoc, is how do we look at these neutron captures in this process? I create roughly half the elements in the world, so it's kind of important. All right, so we know from our previous work with reactions with stellar burning that we need a target, a projectile, detectors that can observe the output, right? So you're gonna have some nucleus, X, some A value plus a neutron, going to give you mu U1 and neutron numbers, so it's A plus one, but you're still the same element, and some energy out that you can see. Okay, easy peasy. We know how to do this, we want one of those, the heavier one thing to be the target, probably the neutrons to be the projectile, let's go. But the nuclei involved, as you saw in that movie, are unstable, right, from the radioactive area. Some of these live for less than a third of a second. It's gonna be sort of rough making a target that will last you days out of one of those. So the nuclei involved are unstable, no problem. That's what we make here, right? We make beams of unstable nuclei at this facility. Perfect, we'll just make the neutrons our target. He's, and then there's another problem. Neutrons are unstable, Fuckers. Neutrons live for about 10 minutes on average. And so that's gonna be rough. We're gonna target that only last you 10 minutes, especially when it takes roughly like a day for them to deliver beams to generate the exact nucleus that you want here and then deliver it to you. So that's not gonna work. We're done. We can't, we can't look at this. We can't do this. Right? So what have we done over and over again throughout the presentation? You have to start out maybe just change your perspective. So let's look at it a different way. That way won't work. This direct reaction won't work. Not right now. I don't think it's impossible and possible. I do think that there will be a way in the future for us to do them, but we don't have it right now. So we have to find a different way to look at this. Possibly we can access, using a different mechanism, information about this product nucleus here. And we can understand then some properties that'll help us better calculate what this, the probability that this reaction occurs is. And that's exactly what we do here at the NSCL. So this is a schematic of the NSCL as it is right now. Um, it will change in the future and that's very exciting. So we have our coupled cyclotrons, the K500 and the K1200. We use a, what we call a primary beam be a stable, heavy, heavier beam than what you want coming out. So say you want cobalt, you might use a krypton beam, heavier. What we do is we take that heavy, stable beam, and we accelerate it to 130 MeV per U. So if you times that by, say, the 78 or whatever, the krypton, that you're doing pretty high energy. We're speeding along here. And then right before this, uh, orange will lead it. That's a technical term for it. Um, that's a joke. It's not a technical term. Um, is a stable target of a light isotope. Or we're going to pummel that light isotope with these heavy, fast particles. And from that, we get a huge scattering, a scatter of what we call fragments. And that's why it's called the A1900 fragment separator. That is the technical term. It will separate from those fragments the isotopes that you specifically requested for your experiment. It does a very good job. Um, you get very little contamination if you want it. If you want a whole bunch of nuclei all at once coming down, they can do that. Um, so using magnets and electricity, it filters out what you've asked for. And then these different colors here coming out send it to all the different target rooms. Now, it's not, uh, as you can probably tell from the schematic where all the walls have been removed, all of these exist in sort of different rooms. There's walls everywhere. If you've been on a tour of the NSCL, even after, you know, it's sort of maze-like. And I don't technically realize this sometimes, but there's a reason for that. My dearest friends have always asked me always ask, why do you guys build your facilities like this? It's a maze in there, it's a jungle. Well, it's because of the radiation. Anything. You want to protect certain areas. You want A 
each of these detector rooms be separated so that someone can be working on a setup over here and not worry about the beam being delivered over here it's for safety and protection and so that more work can get done at once even though we can only send one beam at a time i always find it funny when they ask me that question because it takes you back and you're like oh yeah not everyone knows why we why we have things the way we do um, so for these experiments what we've done is we accelerate our particles and we're looking at those uh, radioactive um, isotopes that don't live very long, a third of a second. And we're sending them down the pipe here to what our detector end station actually looks like. This is a picture, cleaned up, I will admit. But this is what our actual experimental end station looks like when we get beam delivered. So beam comes in from the side here. This is this point here is here comes down and it hits a target right in the middle of this rather large detector. It's about like this big, 16 inch uh, right cylinder, weighs uh, 750 pounds. So that's a lot of material in that small volume. Um, and what it looks at is the light that's emitted from, this, from things happening in the center. And so the midpoint of that detector, the tube that goes in the middle, has a very small hole so that we get almost full coverage, we call four pi, so that's 360 degree coverage of the area at the midpoint. And that's very important because for some of these things that don't occur very often, if you have a higher efficiency detector, if you can see things better, you can get those rare events more easily. So what happens is our ion beam comes in, we have a detector, it looks sort of like this uh, at the center, but it's like this big, really small. They come in and they hit the detector at a certain time. And I, like I said, they don't live very long, right? So that sometime later, a very short time later, they're going to decay. We're going to have that neutron convert into a proton. And when it does that, it emits some light, a piece of energy in the form of light that this detector will and so we can connect all of those um, using electronics and understand this decay process and use the information about the decay of that nucleus to calculate better these neutron captures, which informs then that whole rapid neutron capture process that we looked at. So this is only going to get better, right? Right now, we've done this technique looking at neutron captures. Um, here at the NSCL, where uh, NSCL is getting ready, uh, we're winding down, so their beam time is already booked out to the end of the NSCL time. And um, we have, there's other, other facilities that can also generate rare isotopes um, that live these shorter periods of time. And we're going to move that detector to Chicago, Argonne National Lab, and we're going to utilize some of their beams that they can do really well there. Um, to do the same technique. Then we're going to bring it right back and use it for EFRIB. Uh, EFRIB will allow a very similar type of process to happen, right? With an ion source, so it's different than the cyclotron. But we'll then accelerate our particles to uh, using the 400 kilowatt superconducting RF linear accelerator. There'll be a whole complex situation here where some of uh, the rare isotope production will pass the beam of interest to the experimenters, and then the rest of it can be used for isotope harvesting for medical physics, making new targets out of novel materials, things like that. We're going to pass it through to the existing target areas in the NSCL laboratory. So if you've been on a tour of the NSCL lab, some of those target rooms are going to stay just as they are. We're going to still be able to use some of the excellent, amazing equipment that we have here with these better beams. What's really important about being able to use the equipment that we already have is that it will allow us to utilize the high energy beams from EFRIB, as well as the two other systems that are really important for astrophysics. Astrophysics doesn't happen at these fast energies that, um, even though it is high temperatures, right, we're like thousands and thousands of degrees. In the laboratory, that amounts to actually a small amount of energy. And so we have to actually slow down the beams, which makes the stopped and reaccelerated beam here at the laboratory really important. So we're going to slow those beams down and then reaccelerate them 
these stellar temperatures where these reactions actually occur and utilize all of the excellent detectors and machinery that we have here to study the probability for those reactions to occur at the actual stellar temperatures that they would occur at, which is really phenomenal. And you don't have to extrapolate anywhere. So what are the capabilities, right? We've been looking at the chart of nucleides, so I wanted to show you the capabilities of efferent and how powerful and awesome this is going to be for studying these rapid neutron capture processes. Stellar burning is very interesting. There's still a lot of questions there, but I will say that a lot of that can be done at some of the smaller facilities that use stable beams. And it's really important that they do that there because we don't have time to use stable beams here when we have the power to do all the radioactive isotopes how many there are that need to be done. So here is a color-coded graph, a uh, color-coded chart of nucleus. Here is a black line that indicates this rapid neutron capture process that we discussed. That's like sort of the far reach of that. And as you can see, effort beams will actually be able, hopefully, to access the nuclei that are actually involved in this rapid neutron capture process. We've yet to be able to actually measure these on the actual process line because it is so far from stability until this facility comes online. Additionally, the color coding is the projected rate, how much beam can be produced um, at FREP. And so I've added some, some sort of like recommendations of things that we'll be able to do. So you can see in blue, which is quite a lot actually, uh, the beam will be at a high enough rate that we can actually do those direct reactions, which will be great. It would be even greater if you could impinge them on these runs directly. So let's move on for that right now. Uh, we have less beam, but still quite a lot on this green line, which is sort of on the edge. You're getting pretty, uh, pretty short-lived. That's great for verification um, things to verify a new setup or detector system. To measure something that has been measured previously with a new system and verify that you know exactly how your detectors work before you spend that hourly rate to get way out here in the red where, you know, you're measuring the beam rate would only be enough to maybe measure a half-life. You don't get enough down the pipe that you can do something super substantial in terms of information with. We'll extract absolutely as much as possible, but feasibly with the beam rates and the statistics that you can achieve there, a half-life measurement is going to be what we can achieve. And in some cases, that's going to be good enough. Because then you can test some of these theoretical models that are used in these calculations to see how well they're doing at predicting these things. Like I said, especially in the red, we've never been out there before. We don't know. We're going into the future here. So it's really exciting work that we'll be able to do and answer some of the questions uh, about how the elements are formed in some of these really exciting cataclysmic systems, such as neutron star mergers, supernovae, things are blowing up and you literally can't be there, right? So I'm gonna open it up now for questions, but I do want to say, I do wanna end kind of back where we started. Um, this is actually a picture of the night sky um, from just about a month ago uh, that I found online on NASA's website. Um, so it's kind of interesting. There was a meteor shower at that time, so that's what that Line is, but I definitely want anytime you're feeling like, ugh, not today, today's awful. Just remember, we're all made of star stuff. So I hope you all have a stellar day. <laughs>
as we add neutrons, so you start over here, things are stable, you continue to add neutrons, you'll get to a point here where they predict, theory predicts, that you can no longer add neutrons on. They would just fall. And so that's the drift line. That's the extent that we think will happen. If you look, so work is being done actively in this region of how far out can we go? In fact, one of the scientists here at the NSCL, Oleg, uh, Frostak had a paper come out this year that they pushed out calcium 60. It was like, I think, farther than people thought we could get. They observed calcium 60 in the laboratory, which is huge, right? Because then you're saying, okay, well, this is as far as we can go. And then they said, but we stop here. Right? So you're like, oh, okay. So then you can work. This is, I've always loved, I love this case specifically because it's so demonstrative of how science works in our field. Um, and I love, I got this from a different scientist who gave a presentation. Science works in terms of theory and experiment like a walking man. One makes progress, the other catches up, we bump something, so we have to keep making progress. So one step was made, another step gets made. And so um, up to date theory right now would predict the gray line is where the drift line is, but you gotta push that. Gotta try and observe something beyond that.
relationships work either. Um, you have to be able to problem solve. You have to be able to change your perspective and come at things a different way if they're not working. Or say, when people tell you that's impossible, say, well, it just turned out impossible eventually. <laughs> you know, and just like keep working. I think the scientists were all very tenacious people when you're into a topic that you like, which is why I wanted to deep dive sort of into the nuclear astrophysics, because we can understand from astronomy and observations, yes, the elements are created in the stars. If you just keep asking how, you get to the deeper, more complicated questions that are just really fun and rich environment to work in. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Are there any other questions? Oh. Oh.